So now we will move to the, uh, the third topic of future proof and we have an absolute wealth of questions here which we can only try to do justice to. Um, as people have been uh, very good, <laughs> we might even squeeze in a few extras. So what I propose, what I'm going to do is we'll have the same format as before, a headline question that everybody gets two minutes and a minute to uh, respond for the first person to speak. And then actually if we do manage to have time, two groups of supplementary questions of three each. Yes, you're right, it is complicated, but it seems to be going okay mostly. Um, so, um, and the, the third, the, 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 the second set of questions are going to be drawn from what questions that were submitted in advance. But in fact, we have uh, a, a three questions here, which we will then, I will then um, use, uh, approach in the same way from the questions that were brought as people came in. The other questions brought as people came in, I will fit them in in the, what happens next. So, gentlemen, uh, Future Proof, and the person going first this time is Steve Guy, don't um, Future Proof question is, low fossil fuel use will limit climate change. Do you think that energy derived from fossil fuels should be priced high to protect the environment or kept low to stimulate the economy? What action will the candidates' parties be taking to combat climate change? And, uh, yes, Steve. Uh, sorry, Steve Guy, Lib Dem first, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, there's a very passionate debate that goes on in the Bucks Free Press week after week after week between a couple of correspondents that keep writing in, arguing about whether climate change is real or not. Um, I think the, the vast majority of scientists are agreed that climate change is real, and the vast majority of scientists are agreed that we contribute to it. Therefore, it would be irresponsible of any any government of, of any colour not to take it seriously. So, what do what do we do as Lib Dems? We try to put a green thread into everything we do. We try to encourage um, renewable electricity generation. We also try to encourage uh, insulation of homes, energy conservation. We, um, to answer the question directly about would I proof of charging more for carbon-based fuels? Uh, I, I think the answer is yes, but what we want to do with that money is then use that money to invest in renewables. So we're setting up, um, uh, for example, there's a new tidal generation plant going up um, off the coast of Wales. Um, wind farms, very controversial, not quite sure why. Um, but these things at the moment, you'll be told that Wind farms, for example, provide more expensive energy. Uh, solar pr provides more expensive energy. Well, it won't if we, if we continue to invest in it and we continue to encourage those methods of generation, they will come down in price. Um, and I think we are seeing that starting to happen now, but we should, do, as a government, it's our responsibility to encourage it and drive things in that direction. Thank you very much. Uh, Steve Baker, Conservative. Well, throughout the last parliament, we had a Liberal Dem Democrat uh, energy and climate change minister, and uh, uh, he's, I think it's fair to say, he's done a good job of seeing through the Climate Change Act, which remains in place. I mean, that, all that stuff is still happening, and sometimes I feel like we talk about this issue as if, um, as if somebody was proposing to repeal the Act. They're not. It's in place, and it's being implemented. Um, the UK share of electricity generation from renewables, it says in my brief, has doubled since 2010, for example and uh, carbon emissions have come down by 6%. But to answer the question, I think that the right way to deal with this is to price in the, the cost of carbon into these fuels and then let the market work to produce the right outcomes. Um, if I recall correctly, and I would have to go and check the docs or get the phone out, which I was told off for last night, yeah, you're not the, the Stern review, I think, came up with a price of something like 11p on a litre of petrol. Well, if you look at the sheer scale of fuel duty and how little difference it makes to people's consumption of petrol, it's arguable whether it would make very much difference. So I think we are where we are. Personally, I ride a nice, big, but efficient 1200cc uh, motorbike. I think David's got one with the same engine. Um, I've got an old Saab, seems to be quite efficient. I haven't replaced it for 10 years. That seems to be my bit for the environment. But, um, you know, we, we are where we are. The, the transport fleet's being decarbonized. All these things are going ahead. My, one of my pleas would, would be, let's stop talking about this issue as if the argument had been lost by the Green Lobby. The argument has been won by the environmentalists. The act is in place. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. Then, uh, 
Jen Bailey Green. Oh, sorry. Um, no, that's over to you, Jen. Okay, no problem. Uh, sorry. Interesting today, wasn't it, really? This, um, in the news, um, the Supreme Court, the highest court of the land, has actually come up and said um, this government must take action regarding the pollution in the air. Sort of speaks for itself, really, doesn't it? Um, am I against, obviously, fossils? Do I think fossil fuels should be um, charged more? Of course I do. I mean, it, it's, it's, a dead, it's a dead economy. It's, it, it's, a, it's a limited fuel, fuel system that's not, that's going to, you know, it's infinite and it's going to run out. We live, at the end of the day, we live on an island. You know, we have the facilities of actually producing our own renewable energies for either tidal, tidal wave um, production or wind farms. It's funny that Ed Pickles actually is pretty much banned or refuses every single planning permission for onshore wind farms now. Why we can't go offshore is another reason. You drive down the M4 and the M40, which I do a fair bit, there's solar farms um, cropping up all over the place, mainly because of the wind farm things aren't there. Why on earth we, can't we produce our own energy? You know, we, there's worry about the Far, um, the far East um, and the actual oil security there. We can be pretty much a self-producing country and we can be one of the richest com um, countries in the world by producing our own energy. Thank you very much, Jim. And uh, we'll come to, I'm, on, I'm losing my chart here, David Williams Labour, please. So, should fossil fuels be priced low to stimulate the economy or priced high to deter usage? Um, I think there's a middle ground um, to that. I don't, I don't think you have to um, go to one or the other because if you price it high, um, you affect the daily lives of millions of people. Um, who currently struggle to pay their energy bills. Um, if you price it too low, you are not really addressing the environmental arguments. So I think there's a, there's a middle way. Um, but I think the most critical part of the equation actually is something which Jem is referring to, which is our commitment to acknowledging climate change and taking steps to combat it by transferring our uh, reliance for energy needs onto renewables and uh, it's a great shame that uh, over the last five years we've seen such a lack of ambition really um, to address that. I mean, the Labour Party is committed to a, a much more rapid move um, to reducing carbon emissions and to leading the, um, the world agenda on it. And Jem's absolutely right, I mean you, the UK is a country which is rich in renewable energy sources, whether it's water power from, from tidal resources or rivers or wind or sun. Um, I can imagine some of the south-facing slopes in Wickham would generate a, a very large amount of electricity if, um, if they were utilised. Uh, but we do have to, we do have to recognise the need for it and invest in it. And of course, investing in it, becoming a world leader in it, which we should be. I mean, given the country that we live in, as I say, the, the, the huge resources we have um, in that way, we should be a world leader in renewables. Um, Wickham could become a world leader in renewable energy industry. Ten seconds, David. Thank you very much. Lovely. And we have... Is David Thank you. Thank you. Um, the concept of Chuck climate change is actually under debate. There's an international, I was just reading the other day, there's an international study taking place which is, is investigating why it is that in the past the uh, manipulation of the figures has, has been downwards, whereas more recently the manipulation of the figures has been upwards, seeming to show more, more climate change than that actually possibly might be happening. Um, so, first of all though, does man contribute to it? Well, the reason apparently that we do is because of CO2 emissions. But if you talk to the geologists, the Earth at one time is 95% CO2. So we're still here though, in spite of that. And in fact, the CO2 emissions are the equivalent of a ping pong ball within the Royal Albert Hall. So let's move on to the effect that it has on us and the cost of fossil fuels. Well, the 2008 Climate Change Act, UKIP would repeal. Basically, it's caused huge problems already. It's resulted in the, in the closure of 20% of our uh, viable electricity generation uh, stations. And uh, while we've been closing down coal-fired stations, they've been continue to be built in Germany. It's led to the loss of uh, steel and aluminium manufacture in this country. 
to countries abroad such as China and India where the emissions, CO2 emissions for those worried about that are actually twice uh, the UK figures on a per tonne basis. So we've lost our industry and doubled the uh, CO2 emissions. Not a, very good, uh, not a very good record there. Um, as a, and in terms of the um, day-to-day -day issue, I looked up the spread of, of diesel and petrol prices in the EU. Because wouldn't you think that for fair competition, given all the goods travel, that there'll be narrow band? No, there's actually a two-thirds band. You can, you can buy a litre of fuel in Bulgaria for just over one euro. Netherlands, nearly 1.7. It's you, you, you couldn't make it up. Um, we need, we need, you know, you'd expect the EU at least to manage um, equitable fuel costs, but Thank it you, even Dave. fails on that. Thank you very much. And uh, Steve Guy, you've got a one-minute response. Well, it's, it's probably fair to point out that the average wage in Bulgaria is a lot less than the average wage in the Netherlands. <laughs> um, look, the, the Native Americans had a saying. They said, we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And what the UKIP are asking you to do is, is to perhaps gamble, if you like, that climate change isn't really happening and we can't really do anything about it. And I just don't subscribe to that view. I think we have to do um, the responsible thing because, you know, the, the, the problem, the, the damage that we do to the climate, if we choose to ignore the problems, we're not going to pay the price of that damage. We can all drive around in our four by fours and burn coal and do whatever we like won't affect us, it's the next generation and that's that's why the majority of us around this table care about CO2 and care about the climate because we want to leave seconds. it in a good state for our kids. Good job, that was Thank you very much Steve. Right, now have I missed anyone out this time? No, good. Um, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to, because we're taking two, I'm going to do two more sets of questions which will be three questions read out together and then another three questions read out together. So I'm going to uh, just move the order in again and just to say, so Steve Baker, you'll be starting off next time. Um, and I'm going to slightly reorganise the order of these questions. I'm going to take a number of questions that seem to relate to each other. Um, I hope that, that will you'll feel the same way about them. So first of all, from our pr uh, submitted questions that submitted beforehand, um, in view of the annexation of the Crimea by President Putin and his support for the rebels in Ukraine, his threats to Estonia, nuclear threat of North Korea, the danger caused by, caused by ISIL, Boko Haram, Somali rebels and others, do the candidates agree that it is the first duty of the state to ensure the security of its people? And if so, what do they propose? And then I'm going to uh, switch to questions that came through the door. And thank you very much for putting names on these, although I'm not actually going to be reading names at this point. What are you going to do about the continued occupation of the West Bank by Netanyahu's government? Why Kashmir's issue is not in your manifesto, but your party has mentioned other issues like Iraq, Syria, Palestine, etc. And that's to all the parties. Is it not irresponsible of all the parties to ignore making a commitment to invest 2% of GDP in defence in view of the escalating instability of the world? Would the candidates please comment? Um, so I realise that was four questions, but as they, there does seem to be a, a shared theme there. Um, so Steve Baker, would you start off and you'll get a one minute response at the end. Well, it is a dangerous and uncertain world, perhaps um, more so than for a very long time, at least when I was growing up in the Cold War. Or at least it was the one main enemy and we sort of knew where we stood in this uh, horrific standoff. It'd be lovely to live in a world that didn't have or didn't need nuclear weapons. I'm afraid we do need to have a strategic nuclear deterrent and it does need to be a second strike capability and that means four submarines and it means at sea and it means Trident renewal. And that is the Conservative policy, it is the Labour policy which I've personally stood up in Parliament and tested. Um, and I will vote for that. Uh, we also, of course, need good quality conventional forces, and that good quality means interoperable. If you're interested in why it is we've got such a small air force, for example, um, please have a look at my website where I've explained. But I've discussed this with Chiefs of the Air Staff successively. We have such capable aeroplanes in order to be interoperable. When you look at the sheer cost of equipment today, we are always going to have to operate with allies in the event of a major war. Russia is worrying. I went over to Lithuania at one point um, to, to, to meet some people and Lithuania has become a place which is quite concerned about the Russians and it, you can see now 
quite rightly so. Russia, I understand, still routinely trains to use tactical nuclear weapons. These are extremely serious matters, and so we need a strong, capable armed force in the conventional sense, and it has to be backed up with the big stick of Trident. On the 2%, we've got the second largest defence budget in NATO, the biggest in the EU. We're committed to 2% of GDP in 15, 16, and then there's a spending review. Various pledges have been made to maintain the number of soldiers and the equipment programme, uh, but that is basically where we are. But yes, it is the first duty of government to maintain our security. Without that security, we cannot have our liberty. So yes, I want a strong defence, and I want us to live in peace, in a sense it's peace, peace, peace through the strength. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Jen Bailey Green? Invest in um, sort of do we agree the security of people? I mean, the whole Green P Party thing is, um, as it's been put in the press, is not is it all about Trident? And we, no, we wouldn't replace Trident. Um, it's, it's, do I see a world where we could ever use nuclear weapons? Would I want to live in a world that we actually go around and use nuclear weapons? I don't think I do. I mean, there's there's a lot better ways of actually going out and actually dis to actually defuse in this situation. It's interesting. It's like former MI6 head of um, counter-terrorism has said actually getting people like Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iran around the negotiating table would be far much more effective than bombing. I think that's the way forward. There's other options there. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, any further comments then? So, no, thank you very much. And then, uh, Jen, uh, coming to David Williams, Labour, please. Um, plainly there are a lot of threats and a lot of instability in the world, but I, I, don't, I still think the world is a better and safer place than it was many years ago. Um, I mean, the Cold War has ended, you know, the Eastern Bloc is over, the sort of immediate risk of a confrontation of tanks rolling over the German border is, is gone. Um, we've resolved the situation, for instance, in um, Ireland, you know, we've reached a peace agreement. And for me, I think um, it's not, uh, I, I'm completely at odds with Steve in a sense on this. I don't think it's peace through strength. I think it's peace through conversation. I think, I, I think we've achieved peace over all of these years through international cooperation. Um, whether it was with, through NATO, through the United Nations, through the European Union, through the Commonwealth, through the Good Friday Agreement, it's all actually about talking to people, sitting down even with people you don't think you can talk with, and trying to find some common ground, trying to um, trying to get over the, the prejudices or the injustices which have led to the situation um, which has occurred. So, um, for me, yes, obviously we have to we have to um, have a defence budget. We Labour Party says we'll have a strategic defence review um, to look at the current threats that we face and to ensure that we're in a position to to meet them. Um, but you know, things like um, things like Kashmir again, it's talking, isn't it? I mean, Kashmir is is in a dreadful situation, and um, you know, we, we we talk about devolution and rights for Wales and Scotland. We need to to look at places like Kashmir and and say that they are entitled to uh, self-determination if they wish. If we support a two-state solution in, in um, Palestine and Israel. We need to support that and put pressure on uh, Israel to, uh, to address that. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's all about cooperation. We're all Thumbs human up. beings. We need, we need to talk to each other. Thank you very much. Uh, then David Meekle, you can, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, it is indeed the first duty of the state uh, to secure the people, secure the state. And uh, that's perhaps why it might be alarming to you that um, I heard today that the um, European Parliament has passed their asylum policy. And the effect of that is that because asylum is so widely defined to include, according to Juncker, those escaping poverty. So in other words, asylum now is being broadened to include economic migrants. Uh, there is no uh, effective measure to stop ISIS um, fulfilling their ambition of sending a half a million of their extremists into Europe, which of course 
then means they've got total freedom of movement uh, to undermine from within. Um, Sorry, David, no interruptions. So, um, UKIP's policy, is, uh, as far as spending is concerned, is that we would spend some 16 billion of the 100 that we're not going to be uh, wasting on the EU foreign aid, HS2 and the Barnett formula, on to restoring defence to the levels prior to the 2010 strategic review. So thus, we are the only party that have already committed to maintaining the 2% NATO uh, requirement um, of GDP being spent on defence. Uh, you've talked about... 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I think also we, want, we are against the EU army. Um, NATO has done a great job, and this is, is what should be leading. Uh, we also should stop being the world's policemen, I believe, on less resources. There are a number of wars that I don't agree with, that UKIP doesn't agree with, Afghanistan being one. Quite frankly, there's more threat to this to High Wycombe from the heroin that's grown in Afghanistan than uh, any perceived future threat from the Taliban. That's already happening. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Then, uh, David Meacock, and uh, we come to Steve Guy for dinner, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, David. Are you not thoroughly ashamed of what Farage said in the Daily Express today? Scaremongering about half a million ISIL people coming to Europe. through It's just one of the most disgraceful and disgusting things I've seen in weeks. Um, I mean, to, to come on to the question, yes, the, the, we, we do, we do um, see, see a much wider range of threats nowadays than we've ever done. And he's an expensive character, this Putin, isn't he? Because apparently we still need four Trident submarines or four replacement Trident submarines just to deal with Putin. I mean, it, it, wouldn't it be just cheaper to get rid of Putin? But <laughs> um, I mean, to, 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 to be serious, though, you know, it was always the, the perceived wisdom that the, the, the Soviet Union was the, was the threat. And it, the, if it went rogue, then the only defence that we'd got was the threat that we could wreak as much destruction on them as they could on us. And we don't really live in that world now. We don't really live in a world, I don't think, where Putin would go so far as to take on a NATO country. Um, I think it's time to start thinking about, does the nuclear deterrent need to be four submarines? Does it need to be a full light, full light replacement of what we got? Or should we start looking forward to moving towards a world uh, where one day we might actually seconds. get rid of all of them. Um, personally, the part of the defence budget I'd like to protect would be on the more conventional forces, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy. Um, I'm very concerned about the amount of uh, cuts that have been made to, to regular forces uh, over successive parliaments, not just the last one. Ten seconds. Um, and I think that conventional forces, unfortunately, are going to continue to be important with the threats that we're currently facing. Thank you very much then. And then uh, Steve Baker, Conservative, a minute to respond, please. So, you know, actually voting on these issues of war and peace really does concentrate the mind. Um, you can see my record for yourselves, and it's, uh, again, on my website if you want to know what I thought about things at the time. But, of course, conversations. Of course we should have an active diplomatic programme. And this government, this past government, has done a lot to reinvigorate our foreign office operations, have the previous one, having really abdicated much of it to the European Union. Um, Putin understands strength and power. And when you're having a conversation, you do have to back that conversation with the ability to exercise power. Now, the Liberal Democrats have in the past said they would like a tactical nuclear weapon or an air-based one, but the problem is it is not second strike. And that is one of the, in the madness of the arithmetic of nuclear weapons, you have to have a second strike capability so that your opponents, your enemies, know that you can still come back. And I just remind you, Putin still exercises with uh, tactical, the idea of tactical nuclear weapons. Sri Lanka, Kashmir, Iran, these are all people from all those countries were out with me canvassing earlier. Kashmir, I didn't win the argument to get it into the manifesto. We can discuss that later. Sorry, sorry. Um, and uh, Palestine, I voted to recognise it immediately because we need a viable two-state solution. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you all. Well, what action will the candidate parties be taking to relieve poverty in developing countries? And then um, a slightly longer question. Britain is part of Europe by virtue of its geography, its history, its language and its culture. We're a medium-sized European country with many strengths and weaknesses. 
we face massive global challenges. We cannot resolve these issues on our own. In the EU, we can be a highly influential member of a 500 million strong economic superpower. Isn't it time we faced up to reality and started urgently rebuilding bridges with our fellow Europeans? So, I look forward to responses on that one. Um, and we will go with uh, Jen Bailey then. Are you happy to start there, Jen? And uh, you'll have a one minute response at the end. It's both of those questions together, please. So, it's a bit of a squash. Poverty and the EU in one go. Yeah, the aid, uh, sorry, aid budget and the EU in one go. On the, yeah, I'll reflect on the aid bu budget. Of course, we want to sort of carry on, um, carry on with that increase. In that. I mean, all you have to do is look at Nepal at the moment and what's happening over there. Um, it was interesting, one of the one of the hustings we did, I think the UKIP actually said they wanted to withdraw that thing. Now, if they had withdrawn that, would we be supporting um, what's going on at the moment? Unfortunately, we live in a changing world, and the, you know, and the world world needs help from it as far as we can. I mean, it's, it's not just only been part of EU, it's been part of a whole you know, world culture. Um, we, are a, you know, we are a rich country. We should offer support where we can. And a lot of, a lot of the trouble that's happening over there is caused by our actions at the end of the day. Um, rebuilding bridges part of Europe, yes, I mean, Europe does many, many wonderful things um, to us and it, it's well worth sort of keeping part of it. I mean, being part of the EU has been progressive. I mean, it safeguards those human rights. It sort of offers a piece of security. It offers environmental protection out there. It also, not only that, it's a spread of culture and a spread and sort of, it's the main thing is probably regulation of our financial system, which we all know what happened there, really. So being part of the EU, yes, we should rebuild those bridges and we should, should obviously keep with it. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, then we'll come to David Williams' labour, please. Um, I'm sure people will remember um, that when <coughs> Labour was uh, in power between 1997 and 2010, uh, we really took a leading role in international in tackling international poverty. And, and Gordon Brown uh, led the debate and ultimately uh, got the result in terms of international debt relief. So uh, relieving those third world and other countries of the crippling debt interest payments they were paying to us and thus keeping them in poverty. So, you know, a relief of poverty is is a core labour value, and ultimately what we've always been about, and always will be about, is helping people, help particularly people who are less able to help themselves. And so we will always maintain that commitment, whether it's to tackling poverty and inequality in this country, or tackling inequality and poverty in the world, we will lead the debate on it, and we will maintain our commitment to the 2% of GDP going on um, international aid. In terms of Europe, um, I mean, there's a, a link back with what I was saying earlier about the, the, the need to cooperate. Um, I mean, we are a part of Europe. Europe is central now to our economy, um, but I mean, it's, it's, a, it's much more important than than just the economy, but if you want to focus on, on that, 44% um, of our trade is with Europe, 3 million UK jobs rely, rely on Europe. Uh, just one statistic, um, 130,000 jobs in Japanese financial institutions in Britain are dependent on us being in the European Union, um, and it's key that we remain in it. We, we don't need a referendum on it. We have to remain a part of it for our future, not just for economy, but for security. I mean, it's no coincidence that we haven't had a war in Europe for 70 years. I mean, the, the European Union is part of our security. So let's stick with it and let's stop the debate on a referendum, which is a break on investment to the country. David, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> so, David Meacock, are you kip? Uh, thank you very much. Well, one of the advantages of coming out of the EU would be that uh, we wouldn't be subject to the common agricultural policy, which actually um, is a barrier to Africa because it actually stops it selling its food goods because of the fixation of prices. Um, in terms of foreign aid, UKIP's policy is to reduce from 0.7% um, of GDP to 02 which would put us on a par with the USA. We would still be spending four billion pounds on 
the sort of things that you and I conjure up in our minds when, we, when somebody mentions foreign aid. You don't really think of supporting nations uh, that have their own nuclear uh, deterrent and space program, um, which apparently is to stop terrorist extremism. I actually had a, a letter to that effect from an MP that I questioned, not hasten, I'll hasten to add Steve, but another MP. Um, that was the justification for it. Um, no, UKIP wants to, want to support programs which, which give people clean water, healthcare, inoculation, emergency aid programs, but we want to cut out an awful lot of waste. In terms of our influence in the EU, as the EU has expanded, so the UK vote has diminished. So we only have about 7% of the vote. The idea that 3, billion job, or 3 million jobs are based on the EU is complete nonsense. Would you, complete, would you stop drinking your Bordeaux or, or buying your German cars if we left the EU? No, of course you wouldn't. And they're not going to fall out with us. Indeed, because they, expect, they export twice as much to us, there will be far more for them to lose than us in a trade war. So no, we want to stay peacefully with our European partners, um, as they are currently now, but we want to have our own trade agreements and uh, have the ability to trade with the whole world and not put all our eggs into the one sinking basket. Thank you very much, David. Um, Steve Guy, Lib Dem. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, we're very fortunate. We live in a very, very wealthy country. And you and I and a great many of us have had very many passionate debates about the state of the NHS in Wickham and what we can and can't get access to. Figures were published yesterday showed that two-thirds of the world's population live more than two hours from any kind of medical help where they can get basic surgery. And the example that was given was appendicitis. In two-thirds of the world, if you get appendicitis, you're likely to die from it. So let's just get this in perspective. We're a very wealthy country, and the amount of money that we spend on foreign aid is minuscule to us. And, and the idea that, that we should consider cutting it as you keep want to, I, I find disgraceful. Of course, we have to be careful how it's spent, and we have to be careful what projects we support with it, but that's different to actually cutting the aid budget, which is what UKIP would like to do. As far as the EU is concerned, um, actually David's right. There is a disgraceful situation where, uh, for example, uh, you can buy British sugar for less money than you can buy fair trade sugar from West Africa, even though it costs far more money to produce sugar here. Um, doesn't mean to say I want to get out of the EU. It means that the EU isn't perfect. It means that there are things that need to be reformed, there are things that need to be changed, there are things that need to be improved. But the EU will go on without us. If we vote to leave the EU, the EU will carry on doing all the things it does without us. We're better off being part of it, and we're better off influencing it from within as one of the largest members than standing on the outside. And with regard to cars, it's nothing to do with German cars or French wine. For example, we manufacture a lot of Japanese cars in the UK. Honda and Nissan have plants in the UK. Now, the reason they have them in the UK is because the UK is within the EU. If we leave the EU, they'll move those plants to the continent. Thank you very much. Um, where are we? Uh, Steve Baker, Conservative, it's you next week. Well, at considerable political cost amongst members, David Cameron took a brave decision <laughs> to uh, make a stand on international aid and the party continues to do so. Um, the, the, the commitment to spend 0.7 is in there. I understand from more experienced colleagues that it's a very long-standing commitment and that is where we are. When I look at the Legatum Institute uh, Prosperity Index, which comes out annually, I notice something about the country ranking in there. Of course, we're right at the top, and some of the countries which we've discussed earlier, of course, are quite close to the bottom. One of the things that always correlates is entrepreneurship and opportunity. Countries which have high levels of entrepreneurship and opportunity have high overall levels of prosperity, in the fullest sense. I don't just mean material, I mean social capital as well, the fullest sense. And um, low levels of entrepreneurship and opportunity are tend to lead to low levels of prosperity. What we need to do is encourage other countries to have the good, good quality institutions which allow them to flourish, and we need to trade with them. And I, particularly here in Wickham, we have a historic obligation to the people of St Vincent and the Grenadines, 
by coming into the European Union and surrendering our, our ability to have our own trade deals, we did really did leave them in quite considerable trouble. And we need really to trade with the people of St Vincent and the Grenadines. Bananas is a staple there. Uh, we we um, did them some damage by um, joining the EU and not being able to trade with them um, in the same way. Uh, so that brings us on to the European Union. There's really two questions. Number one, should we have a referendum on this profoundly important constitutional issue? And then number two, should we stay in or out? I am convinced that it is absolutely right that the public in this country should have a referendum on our membership. And at some stage, I think, I think at least four parties on this platform have at some point in the recent past been committed to a referendum. We should have a referendum and I would like us to have a renegotiation first. And I am going to be Definitely. supporting David Cameron in the commitment he has made to have that referendum by the end of 2017. Thank you very much, Steve. And so, Jen Bailey, you have a one-minute response, if you wish. Is it? You don't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Just listen, sorry. Worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it's going back to it, really, sort of like, um, as you sort of said, it's like, should we support sort of a referendum? It's just, yes, I mean, Green Party does support a referendum. I mean, because in the day, we want to sort of go da back to a little more of a local le level. We we don't trouble that we got at the moment um, with the EU is actually it's there's that unattainable free trade and growth that you know just just doesn't work. So things need to be brought back to a local level. Um, if we, w we would support a referendum, but of course we would want to stay within the EU full stop. Um, case in the, going back to sort of the aid situation. You know, going back to what we want to do, obviously the increase of the aid, we want to go from 0.7 of, of um, GP to 1%. Um, really, that will sort of focus on reducing the fo um, poverty and That's the support of that one. Sorry. That's not, no, you have got 10 more seconds. Oh, it's all right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't mean to put you off. No. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen.